tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Then, after the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. This past week, I have been meditating on these verses, praying and asking God to lead me for some thoughts to tune for tonight. I know that God has forgiven us from our sins, which can be started by a simple temptation. No matter what we do, He will forgive us. So as you worship with us, know that you are forgiven.
So, um, it had been a while since we had been downtown in Chicago, but uh, our daughter, Hannah, had her 20th birthday on July 20th, 2020. And she was born at like 8.30, so she missed being born at 20 hours and 20 minutes by like 10 minutes. So, kind of crazy. Um, but she loves the city, and so she wanted to go downtown. And one of the things we talked about doing was going to the Willis Tower, Sears Tower, sorry. Um, and we decided we were going to go to the Sky Deck. And I had heard about this, that they had built these like plexiglass boxes where you could go out and stand. And you look down and literally all you see is like open air and the ground, right? And just you're, you're up 103 stories or something like that. And uh, if, you, if you know me... Some of you probably do. You know I have an extreme fear of heights. I hate heights. Like, it just, it, it causes anxiety in me. It's just scary. And, um, but, you know, I'm with my family, and they, like, take your picture, like, in the box or whatever, so you see the city behind you and all that. And I thought, you know what? I need to do this with my family. But I'm terrified. Like, just terrified. So I had to come up with a strategy, right? So my strategy was, first... I was not going to look down, right? Because the box is there and it's just open. So I figured as long as I don't look down, I could step out and I'd be okay. Well, I stepped out and I turned and the camera's up there and you have to step out a little bit further than just right there. So I'm leaning like this to make sure I'm not too far out from the building. The crazy thing was as I stepped back, I could feel the building sway. And I thought maybe it was my imagination, but the Sears Tower actually will sway three feet in the wind. It's designed, it'll normally sway about six inches off center each direction, but it can go up to three feet either way. And I fortunately did not know that until after I stepped out of the box. Um, but I had to have this plan in place for me to accomplish this goal. So I, I took the picture and it backed off. And then I hadn't looked down yet, and I thought, oh, it'd be kind of cool to step out there and take a picture of my foot, right? I couldn't even get my foot, like, halfway over the thing. I was like, oh, my gosh, we are way up high. It's crazy. Um, so I had to have a strategy. I had to have a plan, and it worked, right? But I think oftentimes in life, we kind of go through life without a strategy, without an idea of how do we live this life in faithfulness and obedience to Jesus Christ. And this is where this passage comes in. If you've got your Bibles, open up to James chapter 1, verses 13 to 15. Um, Kaylee read it kind of in the worship, and, and that was great. Um, and, and I just want to reiterate this again. We're going to read it again. Um, James 1, verses 13 to 15 says this. And this is in the New American Standard. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil. And he himself does not tempt anyone, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. I occasionally like reading other translations because it kind of helps me just to better understand it. So the New Living says this, same passage, And remember, when you are being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. Let's pray before we continue, okay? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you so much that we are blessed to have the full counsel of God uh, in the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. Having your words, your, your communication, your message to us, God. Thank you so much that you love us that much, Lord, that you wanted to tell the full story. And we are blessed, God, to know the truth. We are so grateful, Father. Thank you for this salvation. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that resides in us, God. We are so blessed to have you. And we pray, God, use the rest of this time we have together for your honor and your glory and your namesake. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So as we look at this passage, the first thing we notice is, in all honesty, in my opinion, the person who is, is he's referring to here, that James is referring to here, obviously has a very skewed view of who God is. Because the first thing he does is says, God is tempting me. When I am being tempted, God is tempting me. That really reflects a very improper understanding of who God is. If you look at scripture, you start to see this picture of, of God. And one of the things, that one of the main characteristics of God is he's holy. God is absolutely holy, pure, spotless, holy. If you look at Exodus 15, 11, Moses, after leading the Israelites out of Egypt, after God did all of the, the, the amazing things, um, the, the plagues and, and all the things that happened in Egypt to set the Israelites free, he then leads them to the Red Sea and he parts the waters. The Israelites march through, get through the Red Sea, and then as they finish getting out of there, God closes the waters and it completely engulfs the Egyptian army. And Moses says this after all that happens, verse 15, chapter 15, verse 11, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? How about you? The word majestic is really interesting. I think of, how many, of you ever, how many have you ever been to the Grand Canyon and stood on the rim, south rim or north rim, and looked, and you just see this massive, beautiful landscape laid out before you, how majestic that is. Or you've looked on the Rocky Mountains or, or different places in the world, natural beauty and the majesty. God's holiness is even more majestic than that. God's holiness is, is amazing to observe. His otherness, Him being set apart from this world, His purity, His sinlessness, then you go to 1 Samuel 2.2, 2, Hannah's prayer, after Hannah is, is pleading with God to give her a child. She says this in chapter um, 2, verse 2, There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. You think about these examples, you have a man who has been seeing God do a, incredible things to set his people free. And then you see this woman who has pled with God with something as personal and intimate as bless me with a child. And in both experiences, they praise God for his holiness, that he is not like other gods. He's not like anything in this world. He is so different. He's perfect and pure. We worship a God who is so unique. Now, I, I don't know how many of you have ever done this or, or liked this, but when I was a child, I used to love reading about Greek mythology, right? I love the story of Perseus. Perseus, who, um, you know, he went and killed Medusa the Gorgon, right? And so he was given all these gifts by the different gods, Apollo and, and uh, I think, Hera. And, and you know, you, you read the stories of how the gods interacted with man, right? But the one thing you always could come to the conclusion of is that it seemed like all these gods were just super-powered human beings. They still struggled with lust. They still struggled with anger. They, they made mistakes. They weren't perfect. They were just kind of like bigger versions of us, more powerful versions of us. And there is such a difference between the God we worship from Scripture, from the Bible, than the gods that were a part of the Greek pantheon of, of, of gods or the Norse gods or the, the Hindu gods or all these. This is a God who is absolutely perfect. And in his love, knew that we could never measure up to his holiness and that the only option was to send his son to sacrifice his own loved son, his only son, so we could have salvation. The last passage. This, this one almost seems like out of some science fiction novel. Revelation 4, 6-8. So not only do men and women worship and praise God for his holiness, now we see angels. Chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. And before the throne there was, a, as it were, a sea of glass, like crystal, 
and around the throne on each side of the throne and are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind the first living creature like a lion the second living creature like an ox the third living creature with the face of a man the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight and the four living creatures each of them with six wings are full of eyes all around and within and day and night they never cease to say holy 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 is the lord god almighty who was and is and is to come this is the god we worship this is the god we gather here tonight as a community as a church body to worship this is our god mighty in power pure and holy righteous and true how dare someone say this god is tempting me to sin folks i understand our lives are full of trial and temptation but those temptations do not come from god he is not the one tempting you the passage goes on to say who is it's ourselves so we have a holy god and then we have sinful men the scriptures tell us who we are ephesians 2 1 to 3 says paul is defining humanity apart from jesus he says you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world following the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind we cannot forget where we came from we cannot forget what we were saved from we cannot forget that without jesus christ we have no hope in this world Psalm 51:5 After David was caught in adultery with Bathsheba he says this Behold I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me Behold you delight in truth in the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart So it's not that you're born and then you sin and now you're all sinful the moment we left our mother's womb from Genesis 3 till now and going forward until Christ comes again men and women will be born into sin will live in sin and unfortunately some without Christ will die in sin with no hope for salvation if they don't receive Christ The temptations we face are from ourselves. A pure and holy God would not tempt you to sin. Think about that. Why would a holy God who has never experienced committed sin want to tempt you to sin? What what purpose would it be when the temptation would lead to sin would lead to death? if anything he would want you not to sin so it's a warning for us we have to remember we cannot sit here and blame god for tempting us in the sin because of who god is he will never tempt you to sin but because of who we are temptations will come from us from our own desires and lead us to sin which will then lead to death we just have to understand the equation folks we have to understand what's going on here and this applies to us on our daily lives this applies to every single one of us every single day we are in a fight we're in a battle and we 
need to fight against our own sin. The temptation to do that which would please ourselves, but would be absolutely offensive and contrary to who God is. Let's be honest, you all know what you struggle with. I know what I struggle with. And I'm not standing up here saying to you, you've got to fix yourselves. Because I'm in the same boat you are. The reality is, we need to turn to Christ. The answer is in Jesus. And honestly, we need a plan. When I was a young boy, um, my father and my brother did a sport with me called judo. Okay? And I got fairly good at it, but I remember one time, I was nine years old, I qualified for nationals, and I was like so excited that I got to go to this big tournament, and there were going to be people from all over the country, and we were going to compete against them. And uh, I remember my father looking at me and saying, Mark, you know, you need to, to practice more. You need to do more. And I remember thinking in my mind and telling him, like, Dad, I go to practice three times a week. I'm there two hours, and, and I, I give all I can when I'm there. Like, how much more do you want? And he's like, you know what, Mark? Those three hours, the two hours on, or six hours, the two hours on Monday, two hours on Wednesday, two hours on Saturday, that's like the bare minimum of what you should be doing. That's, that's just like skating by. If you want to do well, if you want to win, or if you want to compete well, you need to be doing more. And I remember thinking, Dad, you don't know. It'll be fine. Well, I went to that tournament, and let me just tell you, I got killed. I got destroyed, okay? I literally, it was a double elimination tournament, and it was over in like 45 seconds. Just guys plastered me. And I remember looking at my father and thinking, man, he was so right. He was absolutely correct. Fast forward three years now, I'm 12 years old, and... um. I, I was in the same situation. I qualified for nationals. And I remember, smartest thing I ever did, I looked at my father, and I didn't say anything to him, but I remember thinking, he told me what I need to do. I better do it. So I would wake up at like 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning, and I would work out for three or four hours every day. Then I would practice, and I practiced four times a week. And I remember just working and working and working. And I was 12 years old. And I was like lifting weights and running and doing all these things, like trying to get in as best shape as possible, as strong as possible, so I could do my best in that tournament. And it paid off. I got, I won. And I just remember looking at my father with much more respect. Because just by listening to him, listening to what he had to say, I was able to win. And I think about that. You know, I think about, do I apply myself to my spiritual walk the way I did as a 12-year-old to win a medal that absolutely no one cares about now? Like, if you think about it, when we get to heaven, the one thing we want to hear is, well done, good and faithful servant. We want God to welcome us in and be like, well done. Well done. Folks, on a daily basis, what's your plan for that to happen? Just a couple things. I mean, I did this sermon in a way that I wanted to encourage you to see that Scripture is our sole source. Okay? Okay? All I did was read to you passages from Scripture that would inform you and tell you who God is. And there are so many more. We need to be people of the Word. I don't know what your devotional life is like. I don't know what your disciplines are like. But let me tell you something. Just coming on a Saturday night service or maybe a Bible study, to me in a lot of ways, as I think about it, that would be like me going to practice. Once, twice, three times a week. Like, if that's your spiritual life, if that's, that's it, folks, you're missing out. 
I'm just telling you, you're missing out. Every single day, you could take your iPad or your Bible and, and you could meet with this amazing holy God. You can spend time with Him. You can experience what it means to be loved in spite of what you do. You don't have to just trust what I say or what Pastor John says or what the elders say. You can experience it yourself. And that happens as we open His Word, as we read it, and not read it like a textbook or like something that we just have to get through, but read it as if this is God speaking directly to me. This is God talking to me. And I can know Him. And He knows me. The level of intimacy you can have with God is greater than anything you will ever experience. So read His Word. We've got the middle schoolers now in our Bible study. We're just trying to read a chapter of John a day. We're not doing incredibly deep or long things. We just encourage them, be in the Word. Just be in the Word. Secondly, we need to be praying. We need to be praying. Like, how many of you, if you um, really like someone, how many of you would find out where exactly that person hangs out, where they might work, where they might do things? And if you knew that, how many of you would go the absolute opposite direction to avoid that? If you knew someone that you wanted to know and be with and love, and you wanted to get to know better, you would never isolate yourself and stop communication and stop talking to them. You would be closer to them. You would look for ways to, to run into them or interact with them, do something similar so you can build a friendship or get to know them. Guys, so often I think we as a church, we run from God. Prayer, just in and of itself, just pray. Spend time with Jesus. And if you don't know how to pray, tell him. Just ask him to help you. Because he's closer than a friend. He loves you more than anyone else in this world. And he desires to be with you. Spend time in the Word. Be in prayer. The last one. I think this is, this is a, a, I wouldn't say it's more suggestion, but just something to think about. We need to be wise about our friendships and relationships. I really believe um, that as Christians, we're called to go and minister to the lost. But we have to be very careful in those relationships, if those relationships start leading us away from the Lord, if they start leading us into questionable or sinful situations, practices, things like that. We have to be careful. Evaluate your friendships. The goal of a friendship, if the person is not a Christian, should be that you be able to share the gospel with them at some point. And if you're Christians and your friends, goal should be like iron sharpening iron. We should be pushing each other, encouraging each other, blessing each other, challenging each other to grow closer to Jesus. But if we're in friendships where all that's happening is we're being led away from the Lord, I don't think that's really honoring the Lord. I think we have to look at the level of influence a person has in our lives and be careful about how much we allow ourselves to be influenced by people. So I would encourage you, find those deep friendships. Find those people you can be honest and open with, you can be truthful with, who are going to bless and encourage you as a Christian.
I've been at this church for a number of years, and I'm, I'm really thankful for the time we had, my family and I had here as youth pastor and family and, um, and as missionaries and now kind of back and it's just kind of all fun. Um, but I really honestly want to tell you guys, and I love you, but I don't feel like it would be loving to not tell you this truthfully. Our church can be so much more. Our church could be so much more. And it's not by just doing bigger programs or bigger ministries. Or, I'm not talking about that. I'm saying if every single one of us made the conscious decision to put Jesus first, solely, completely first, this fellowship, this group, this church would have an impact on our city like no other. Because the reality is every single one of you goes to places, works with people, um, frequents restaurants, coffee shops, whatever. You have a specific ability to imprint and touch people that others can't. You carry the message of hope. You carry the gospel to this world. And if we don't put Christ first, he'll get lost in the shuffle of all the things in our lives. He'll fall down the list and we'll stop living with purpose, conviction, conviction with, with a missional focus and drive to make Jesus known. Because in the end, honestly, our cars, our houses, our children, our lives, all that stuff kind of goes away. It comes down to Jesus and us. The crown we receive a lot of times, if you read scripture, man, people, the people God uses us to touch, to share the gospel with, to evangelize to, it's the crown and glory. That's what's going to last. So I just ask, as you guys start thinking about this and we start thinking about next fall and like what we're going to be doing, Realize this, God's given us a mission right now. And it may look different from anything we've ever done before, but maybe that's the point. That it's time for us on an individual, personal basis to make Christ our priority, our focus, our goal, our crown. So be in the Word be in prayer and be in relationship with those who can encourage you and help you go out and reach the law. Let's pray. Father, I, I thank you um, just for this passage and I realize there's so much more that could be said, but I feel like this is what you wanted to accomplish, God. Forgive us, God, if we've accused you of tempting us. Forgive us if we have a wrong view of who you are. But help us understand the consequences of our sin, the consequences of what can happen. But also understand this. You invite us into a relationship that is so much greater and more real than anything in this world. And I pray that, Father, as we seek after you, God. You would change us. You would make us more like you, Lord. I ask, Father, that you'd meet us where we're at. Maybe some of us have not read our Bibles for months. God, it's simple. And it's a simple turn. Help us just to turn back to you. 
to open our hearts, our minds, our lives to you. Because you are right there with us, God, and we love you. Thank you so much, Lord, for your blessings, for your encouragement and your love. We pray this all in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand and sing as we sing our last song tonight? Yeah.